Howdy, folks. Welcome to the Dynamic Store. My name is Eric Laguerre, your host and founder of Dynamic Store Recruitment, opening doors to Microsoft Dynamics professionals since 2019. We have another fantastic episode of another open dialogue format webisode of Dynamic Store. I'm here with our guest, Alex Anaveros. Alex, how are you doing today? Doing great, my friend. Happy to be here. Fantastic to hear that. Uh, you know, as I know, Alex to me is, is uh, I gotta say, one of my favorite uh, candidates that I've happened to work with over the course of my career. But uh, for those of you who don't know him as well as I do, Alex is a Dynamics 365 customer engagement and power platform solution architect with over a decade of experience helping companies with digital transformation and delivering exceptional project outcomes. In his free time, Alex enjoys a lot of things that I enjoy, and that's singing karaoke, playing guitar, and building Legos. Alex, we tend to start everything out here uh, at Dynamic Store with a good old fashioned origin story, as uh, a lot of people seem to like them, at least Hollywood would, would think the same with some of their superhero movies these days. So uh, go ahead and tell us, Alex, how did the Dynamic Store open for you? Thanks, Eric, uh, and thank you to everyone who's watching this. Uh, so uh, for me, you know, my career really, really kicked off uh, right out of uh, college. So I just, I had just finished up uh, my bachelor's in business administration with a minor in, in uh, computer science. I also had an associate's degree from um, <clears throat> another institution um, prior to that. Uh, but I, I did. A, I graduated from a very well-known university, uh, the University of San Diego, and I was blessed to be able to attend there. Um, I would have never been able to afford. Uh, my parents would, have, or would have never been able to help me go through and uh, attend that school. But my mother happened to work there, and I was able to get a great opportunity there. Uh, so I, uh, after graduating, uh, the first thing I did, just like most people in this. Uh, in, in, the, in just in the workforce uh, coming out of college is I took a job working sales. And it was a job um, at that time working with my wife, um, actually it was her department, her sales department at, a, at an alarm firm. Uh, and so it was a security company. And while I was working at the security company doing sales, they used Dynamics CRM 2011. And they, uh, quickly realized that they needed help with the product. And so uh, me being very, very interested always in, in, in just kind of knowing the inner workings of software and, and different products, I decided to take it upon myself to offer to the CEO um, who I had a reasonable friendship with um, to just go ahead and start um, customizing their system to meet more of the needs of the organization which is like a one to 50 employee company, <clears throat> security company like AOT, that kind of stuff, a uh, good company, family owned. And so that's when I started getting into just scripting, the SOAP language, fetch XML. And so then from there, I just essentially governed their entire uh, dynamic CRM infrastructure as we upgraded from versions over the years, right, 2013, to 2015, to 2016, to 365. All of this was in, online. Uh, and then eventually uh, I just, my career just expanded as I <clears throat> began working with managed service providers um, like Dynamic Consultants Group, um, Proficient, uh, most recently T-Tech Digital, a, a really large firm that does managed services in the Microsoft practice. And so, uh, that's really just, I was always really interested in, in understanding um, something about CRM really just resonated with me. And even though I wasn't trained or, or that I didn't study to be a developer, uh, I ended up, you know, moving up the ranks and, and gaining so much uh, momentum as an architect uh, and, and uh, leading tons of projects. I've, I don't know how many projects I have under my belt at this point, but um, it's been a wild ride. Uh, I'm very extremely passionate, so passionate about what I do. Uh, my favorite part, I think, is working with the client, you know, just letting 
uh, letting that relationship, um, you know, grow through trust and 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 making sure that uh, they feel warm and fuzzy, but also at the same time delivering some serious, really good quality results. So, with that being said, you know, I just I I started off really small. I was in sales, and then all of a sudden they said, you know what, you can take care of our system for the next, you know, seven years. And then in addition to that. I then that once I felt strong enough, that's when I started architecting uh, a lot of solutions and uh, for other firms, not just that firm. Yeah, you know, you said something that I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, you have been doing this a while when you mentioned soap and, and fat XML. And um, when I first started recruiting in this space, uh, we would, uh, you know, I'll keep the agency name out of it, but everybody knows where, <laughs> where I started and everybody in this space is probably familiar with them. But we used to have these like um, skills matrix cover sheets for people's resumes and we'd scrub them and anonymize them to send them out to potential clients, you know, get the conversation started. And on the, the matrix, there would be like soap and rest calls. And I think, you know, like I, I think of like half of the things that mattered for a dynamic CRM developer or architect in 2015, half of the things that took up a column or a row on on that matrix absolutely mean nothing now. <laughs> like don't like don't matter at all. And that was that was one of them. It's funny that you mentioned it. But going back to your experience there, um, making that shift from sales, and then you talked about scripting. Did did you have a background in software development beforehand? No, by no means. Uh, I I literally just started uh, googling. I was always good at that. Uh, and I think that's what one of the things that makes a great developer. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, we all know that, right? And so I just, I, I realized that this company had a, a culture where they were, you know, just their sales department in this case was really suffering with the system and the way it was set up. So I said, hey, you know what? Let me see if I can cut down your, you know, your 45 minute process in CRM down to 15 or 20 minutes so that we can maximize your productivity, you know, and actually have you focus on what you're really trying to do, which is get sales, right? And so, yeah. uh, so transitioning into a developer is, was kind of completely by accident, completely by accident. One of the best things that ever happened to me, I jumped into a career that I absolutely love. Like I said, I love doing what I do. Um, and uh, I just ended up having to write code. And it was terrifying at first because I was like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And then as I did more and more and more, as you all know, practice makes perfect. And so the more I, the, the more I wrote, the more I understood. And that during that whole period, just supporting one firm, which is interesting, right? You're supporting one firm. I learned so much. But then I realized that, the, that it, there was a point in my career back in 2018 uh, mid 2018 my first son was born alexander kylan and uh i just realized you know what it's time for me to go and do something bigger and i need i want to help more people i want to do more for more companies and so i want to have a global impact if you, you, i guess you could say and so that's where i really really started working with a lot of the larger firms uh that i've worked with over the years and deploying you know customer service, uh, marketing, field service. I've done quite a few, but the heaviest that we've done is always going to be sales uh, implementations. I, you know, I even spent a lot of time um, over the last couple of years just, just working within the Azure Azure space and supporting that, that architecture. So yeah, it's been, it's been really nice. And uh, like I said, for me, for me, it was I. It was all by accident. I think for a lot of people, it, it is a by accident uh, that you get into this industry. And uh, we're very blessed because it is a wonderful product that Microsoft offers to us. And uh, and there's so much, so much possibility in terms of what we can do with it. Yeah, you know, so your your pathway into being hands on with actual development is sort of a rarity in the sense that you started in the actual in sales like the operations so you had a keen understanding of the business processes first and absolutely zero i mean not even from an admin panel configuring things perspective didn't know anything at all there either but did you find that when it 
came time to get a hands-on keyboard and start coding solutions, csharp.net and dynamics, um, that having a really sound fundamental understanding of the business processes that you know you're capturing, did did that help your development skills a lot more to understand? All right, well, what's the how's this going to affect the user when I'm coding in the back end? Right. So that's fundamental, Eric. I think that uh, by no, by, there's no question that understanding the business uh, is, at least in my case, it was integral. Uh, I I ended up understanding the business operations from end to end, from sales all the way through, you know, the technicians installing the alarm systems and then the post support experience. And so what I did was I did create yeah an ecosystem based on what I knew the business process was and how it needed to flow. And I think that's really what every project is like. It's, it's you know, uh, with clients, it's, it doesn't matter how big the firm is or how small, it's really about understanding what their business process is and then creating a solution for that, um, whether complex or, or simple. But really it's just finding a way to streamline processes and, and make things just easier for the user experience. So yeah, business business knowledge has always been absolutely critical to the success of my ability to provide uh, provide real value. Okay. Yeah, so the, the I really like what you said, the, the last episode I did too was all about field service too. And 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 I purposely sought that out. I like talking about field service a lot and I, I knew Dan pretty well and well enough to be like, hey, you want to do this? And uh, here I am, we're going to talk about field service again because it's really exciting. It seems like you got lucky in the sense that uh, when uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the timing, when you were at the alarm company, the end user, did you implement field service there for them? <laughs> So that's uh, exactly what we implemented for them. Um, they needed it yeah. more than, than you can imagine. Uh, and at the time there was this product, Resco Woodford, that we used. Uh, and so because I was the only developer and the only person really building anything or thinking about anything uh, around the entire ecosystem of the business, we literally, I, I did convince the owner, I said, hey, we need field service. And we need something for our technicians to uh, do this stuff on iPads. I said they need to have a really streamlined inventory process, and we need to make sure that they have a, a way to input the data easily in a, in a very straightforward uh, UI. And so that's really interesting that you say that because that's where I got my heaviest field service experience. And it's not very common in our industry for field service, a, a lot of field service experience. Once again, by accident, it just made sense for us. We 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 said, yeah. hey, look, we need bookable resources. That's what we have. That's what our technicians are. And they had, you know, in their security context or their business context, they had remote technicians and they had technicians that were in house uh, going into the uh, uh, locally in southern, a lot of yeah. the southern California region, right? Going and installing physically the systems and everything. And so I was supporting both bookable resources as they're called in that module and making sure that the people in the in house who were scheduling the appointments had like the most straightforward experience to use field service because as you know and I'm, I'm sure you've covered it is that field service that module is a beast and there's there's so much you can do with it uh but what i did was i simplified it down to my organization in that case a one to 50 employee company kept it simple and it helped them tremendously. And and so, and like I said, they leveraged those tools like Resco, uh, CRM Woodford, um, so that we could expose it so that they, you know, the outside people could, even the outside sales were using it. I can't, I can't forget about them. The outside sales people um, were definitely using our application to collect information about the users. So it was a really, it was not just a, you know, desktop application, it was fully mobile, um extremely uh extremely fluent and a very very uh streamlined like i said simplified enough so that we could generate uh sales and revenue and also collect information about our client so we have a lot of experience field service uh haven't seen it very much though recently in terms of implementations 
during the last, say, five years of my career. It's just ever so often. It's, uh, well, it's interesting. I mean, especially you've been at T-TAC. I'm, they do field service, but it's not, there's, it's, they do so much retail, I feel like, uh, a lot of retail, customer service-based type stuff where, it's, you know, that's not really a, a thing as, as much. Uh, that that might be something. But it's it's funny because right when you would have, presuming it, it was like 2016, 17, you would have first started working with field service, right? Because like that uh, was... It was probably like more like 20... It was probably more like 2013, 2014. I think. Oh wow! So that, yeah, wow. so that's when it was just you. So that you were just straight up using Fresco. It wasn't even Microsoft. Microsoft didn't even buy yeah. Field One yet. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. it was very early on, and then I was able to, as time went by, I was able to have Field Service and Fresco coexist together. Yeah, Fresco for the mobile, and then I think I don't know if I think I think Microsoft may have bought Fresco. I know Resco's mobile uh, is is built into field service now. Like that's what yeah. field service's mobile interface is based on. So it's like it, it, you're catching it way before it even came into. Like that's that's so early on because 2016, 2017. I remember more and more end users like, hey, we need so much field service, and I'd be getting a hold of contractors. They were like, listen, nobody really had really has it at the you know at this point at least you know since they bought field ones but you know i know a little bit of resco let me talk to them you know and and they were constantly like all right whatever we'll we'll take the risk like i think this guy can do it yeah. <laughs> all right cool and uh yeah it was and and then fast forward at least in my world probably 2020 the latter half of 2020 and all through 2021 Field service architects were insanely high demand for for quite a bit, but I have seen I did see all of 2022 and 2023. It seemed like the demand kind of slumped off a bit, so I I kind of share that that with you as well. Um, you know, flash forward into fast forwarding into the future now with with Dynamics 365 and and you know from your point of view as a technical architect today, what are what are some of the most critical skills that a successful technical architect needs to have today uh to be to be successful in uh in the dynamics world sure so uh, eric i think that number one uh and there's there's many but uh number one is staying up to date uh you have got to stay up to date with the technology it's changing so rapidly and there's no, there's just absolutely no way that you're going to be able to, to grow with your firm uh, and in your career if you don't understand uh, what the possibilities are for the platform. Uh, you know, every quarter Microsoft is changing so many aspects of the Power Platform. Every they're changing so many things about how Azure works. They're optimizing, right? So I mean, they're a business, a very successful business. Business Microsoft, one of the biggest in the entire world, and they're really putting a lot of investment into this. So right now, I think that first and foremost, I would recommend to all you know developers and architects and any consultants that, that work in the space to really, really research what's coming out, um, what new features are coming out. Uh, just understand uh, and be ready to be supporting those platforms because uh, who knows in the next. You know, you just don't know if your next project, you may be required to work on something that's that's in preview, or you may be required to work with something um, that you just absolutely never thought of, of, of researching. So that's number one. Number two is uh, just be extremely uh, dedicated to your client. And what I mean by that is you have, you, you actually have, you have two clients. Um, you have your company that you work for, and you have your clients in terms of the projects that you're given. And I think that it's important that in in a economy that like we have right now, uh, that we give our all. And that's really what I'm getting at is companies are starting to become a lot more flexible with with uh, their their uh, 
what do you call it, uh, their work from home, you know, and like their their policies regarding holidays and, and vacations and wellness. They call it health and wellness in a lot of cases. And so there, I really feel like it's shifting to where companies are really taking care of their, their employees a lot better. But I think that we need to make sure that we don't take advantage of that. And we need to understand, we need to understand that the, the, the most important thing is making sure that we're adding value continually every day to our firm. Um, if you're not adding value, you'll know. Um, even if you're trying to add value, you'll, you'll know because you won't, be there, you won't be there very long. And so um, that's two. And the last thing I would say is, you know, um, I think that to be successful is, is really more about believing in your abilities. So I don't care if you're a consultant or, you know, a junior developer or the most experienced, you know, technical enterprise architect in the, in the world. If you don't believe in yourself and your capabilities and what you can do and what you can offer, then you're not going to get very far. And so I really, that's, that's just, and that might even be the biggest point is just believe in yourself. You know, I'm going through a period right now in my career where I have to believe in myself more than I've ever had to. And I'm, and so with that being said, you know, I couldn't recommend that more is just have confidence in your abilities, have confidence in what you can offer to any organization and, and, and just be yourself because at the end of the day, you don't want to be in a job where you're you're being a robot or you're being something else like you really want to you know provide these services um and also enjoy waking up every single day and be passionate about it and that's what i tell you i said i'm passionate about what i do and it's very important for me to to relay that to the companies that i work for because that 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 passion kind of gets everybody ex inspired and energized and it and it just it works really well. It's it's a it's a synergy that you need to have. So believe in yourself and what you can do, for sure. Never yeah. forget. You touched on a lot of key elements there, and going right off of the first one, and that's keeping up to date with news, technologies, features, etc. It's safe to say that the low code, no code revolution is it's here. It's happening. It's real. It's like climate change, right? Or um, so, you know, from your point of view, what are some of the most drastic changes that, uh, you know, Power Platform, Power Apps have, have brought with it? Um, how, what are the biggest elements to your day to day that have, have changed because of it? Yeah. Uh, so one example, um, which is an entire massive conversation in and of itself, but just to touch on it, <laughs> uh, one example is the, the tremendous shift from, like you mentioned, from your traditional, hey, you know, I'm going to write you a C sharp plugin that runs uh, asynchronously when you update this record or whatever in Dynamics. Um, and now it's, no, I'm going to write a I'm going to create a WYSIWYG power automate job that does exactly the same in 10% of the time than it would have taken doing C sharp. Uh, and it's going to have all these other bells and whistles that I can add in. So one of the biggest shifts has been uh, this, this, there's two things here that are the result. Number one, developers are starting to use more out of the box, low code solutions to provide the results to the client. That's happening tremendously right now. That's something that all of the companies that know what they're doing are leveraging in their contracts. It's, hey, you know what? We're going to use out of the box in every single scenario here in what we can, sometimes even confining the entire contract to everything will be done out of the box nothing will be involved in any written code and and that's a great thing uh because the developers we now have the opportunity to train people in the business after deployment or during deployment to some of these it professionals or business sneeze right on the on the client side 
with our clients on my projects, we can train them to be able to support these Power Automate jobs or these Logic apps or these Canvas apps because they're not rocket science anymore. There's a lot of uh, friendliness to the way that their things are being developed. So that's that's the first thing that I think is a big shift is it doesn't mean that I'm not writing code still. I still write just to write um, a lot of the times because I don't because code is one of those things like playing the piano. Um, which, you know, I, I have a piano back there. I love playing the piano uh, and the guitar. And Eric, you and I share that, 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 uh, that you know, that, that concept of how much we love music and how important that is and integral in our lives and, and things like that. And my guitar is around here somewhere. And so I, I think that it's nice that, that we have the ability to, to have these, what they're calling citizen uh, developers, right? these business users who can now build and support your project uh, or support the project you built for them, the implementation after you're done. It's almost like this, like we're teaching you how to fish and we do that a lot. And, at, at, you know, I did that a lot at T-Tech. T-Tech's a wonderful company. I think they're phenomenal. Uh, we, we taught them how to fish. Um, but at the same time, our jobs became uh, a little bit more um there's more stability in what we were building because when you write code as you as you as you know eric the reality is that you're you're taking on a lot of risk because what happens is microsoft is going to say who knows when you know what that that format in which you wrote x plugin or x workflow or custom api or whatever is no longer valid and supported and so by sticking with tools like, like I mentioned, like Power Automate and Power Apps and working within the confines of what's available there, although those WYSIWYG editors, I think you have a, a phenomenal yeah. opportunity to, to create best practice uh, sustainability and, uh, and scalability of your, of your um, applications that you build. The second thing I would say, the second big thing uh, I think is uh, there's this massive movement um, between uh, the original concept of, hey, you know, I need to do a data integration uh, or I need somebody to perform a data integration from Salesforce to, uh, because I'm moving to Dynamics, to Dynamics 365, which is going to be my new tenant. And we're just going to be using the Office 365 stack. And we need, we need a way to do this. And before the way this was done was, you know, you could do it, well, you could create an SSIS package, which is just a SQL Server Integration Services package, and it has data flows inside of it, and you, you know, you retrieve that data via um, the web API, um, or you could retrieve it via Zip SOAP. I know we mentioned SOAP. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, web services. Yeah, so there's there's SOAP and then and Web API, but you could retrieve it. And then if you wanted to, you want to be a little bit more fancy, like I would be in the sense that what I would try to do is I would always try to leverage the the Kingsway soft ETL tool, you know, all the ETL tool, uh, the, in my opinion, the best ETL tool I've ever used that is locally run on the machine. I hate to interrupt you on that, but I think your opinion is shared by many, many, many others. <laughs> I've spent a lot of time, uh, not so much these days anymore, but uh, in the past, uh, hearing people yeah. gripe about the tribe. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, a, you know, uh, Kingsway Soft is a, a phenomenal tool that has and still will be used, by the way. It's a low cost solution. And, you know, it has one time fees. It's getting more expensive now than it used to be. Uh, but what what you'll find is that everything that, that that we do with SSIS and data transformation from SQL database to SQL database over here, um, it's it's uh, it's it's now going actually in the direction. And to my point, this is what I wanted to get to is we're moving into the Azure platform. People, more companies are moving into Microsoft Office 365, and what they as soon as they make that movement and they realize that their ERP system is disconnected and their other CRM system is disconnected and their phone system and all of these other enterprise applications are outside of that 
you know, that actual ecosystem of Office 365, they are very tempted naturally, and they should be, to consolidate all of that and make sure that they have an ecosystem that talks within, you know, the same model, right? Um, yeah. Maybe they're the same language. Yeah, so really what, what what's happening right now that I've noticed is that there's a big need for Azure Data Factory experience. Azure Data Factory is essentially just imagine, you know, the long are the long gone are the days of you must create these packages in Visual Studio or even work with Scribe, which is a cloud tool uh, for for you know moving data across systems. But no, now now you're going Tipco. It's called now, so not Scribe, but Tipco, and. Uh, but, but yeah, those days are gone. And what's happening is uh, people are going to use Azure Data Factory to create a database in the cloud, use that as a staging table, potentially, and then move the data using SSIS packages that are created in the cloud. And then you're leveraging computing power, uh, computing power in the cloud to to be able to offer these services. And Microsoft is offering them at you know less, you know, a, a tenth of a penny per API call. And so when you start looking at a lot of the benefits of, you know, cost savings, running your integrations in the cloud, being able to schedule their recurrence uh, in a way that is that is scalable for you, knowing that you can run as many, you know, millions or billions of executions, move as much data as you want, um, synchronize as much data as you want. I think that that's a big point right now is Data integration is like probably one of the most common scenarios we run into, right, as developers. So that's why I think yeah. that's a big one. So in a perfect world, and you mentioned something key that is obviously, it comes to no surprise, been a driving factor in the success of the expansion of Microsoft Dynamics in general, or I mean, just all of Microsoft's suite of business applications in general, uh, of their success at least, that consolidation piece, you know, everything in Azure, Office 365 Teams, ERP, CRM, all on this common data model. That's a perfect world, right? Every every business on planet Earth, you know, to me, if they had sense, they would just all run to this, um, Microsoft everything. It, it, it does make sense, but that's, you know, that's not completely the story. So there are a lot of different platforms out there uh, in business applications. What are some of the most common, say, from your point of view, you know, you start Dynamics CRM, so D365 CE is your, your main chunk. What are, what are mainly uh, what other applications come up consistently that you find yourself integrating between? So obviously, you know, Salesforce right now and some of the other CRM systems are very, very common in that we need to integrate with those platforms. I've had projects where the client is not necessarily integrating with Dynamics in any format, shape or form. They're simply integrating with, with Azure and and they want to stay within that framework so it may not have to necessarily be dynamics 365. uh so salesforce obviously as a direct competitor to dynamics is is very common to run into uh people either want to keep it in most cases they're trying to get off of it which is really the business that we're into trying to get you know people onto dynamics ce uh, the other applications that you're going to run into for and as far as data migration um to use uh there are you know xrm toolbox believe it or not there are xrm toolbox applications that allow you to move data um from one place point a to point b and it does it very well on an entity level uh and these are and 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 microsoft has actually vetted xrm toolbox um not that long ago as as provided its support you could say or or you know now now actually talks about XRM toolbox as opposed to saying we don't support that we're not interested in XRM toolbox that's something somebody is building the community is building no XRM toolbox now is well known as a tool it's on the exams that you take for 
for certifications. It's very common. So there's there's like a data transporter tool that you can use to move all the XML and move all your entity record data from one place to another. Uh, there's there's um, gosh, there's the uh, for SharePoint, ShareGate is an, a great example. That's another integration or data migration tool where you've got your on-premises SharePoint perhaps, and you're moving your, your data from on-premise SharePoint over to the Dynamics, or I'm sorry, forgive me, the Office 365 SharePoint online experience, which is very different than the on-premise version, regardless of what version you're on. You know, you could be on the latest on-prem version but it looks so different, it feels so different, it performs like a completely different kind of vehicle. And so those are some examples of some of the tools that you'll see for data migration. Like I said, Tipco, yeah. Scribe, Tipco slash Scribe is a, is a common cloud-based solution. Uh, right now though, what you're gonna see a lot of is, 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 is really gonna be some, some combination of either Kingsway Soft and SSIS packages or those being hosted and run in computing power in the Azure uh, data factory in the Azure okay. management studio. That's that's really what what you're what you're going to see is like kind of like an even or fairly even split between those. So yeah. it, it seemed like becoming more prevalent too with the Azure data factory. I remember I think it was 2017. Microsoft announced uh, this uh, the ability to host SAP as for HANA in Azure and, and share that, that data. And since then, I've seen the, you know, CRM ERP combo of Dynamics 365 plus SAP. Uh, I've seen it be a lot more common lately. Have, have you run into uh, to projects that involve that CRM ERP combo? So I have not run into that specific combination, but what I will tell you is that what I run into extremely frequently is that there is an ERP system like Infor um, or something else. It could be Infor, it could be a variety of things, but NetSuite, whatever. But there's some sort of, and you know that ERP systems, there are just like CRM, there are hundreds of them at least. And so I run into the situation frequently that I have client A wants this. They want their ERP system to talk to Dynamics 365. They want to maintain that synchronization for some period of time, which is risky, but you think we do it. And then, and then after a certain period of time, they're going to cut off that connection. They're going to slice it and they're, everybody's going to live within Dynamics 365 because uh, their ERP system has been for them historically, their CRM, their operations, their everything. And when they realize that they can go to a platform like Dynamics CE and do everything there as well, and in a, and in a, in a format that is a lot more user-friendly and extensible, they make that move. So uh, I really have seen a lot of, of just the customer has ABC ERP or DEF ERP, and we're just we're making sure that we can get that data over and architecture over and dynamics so that the users can have a centralized holistic experience instead of having disparage disparaging or segregated systems going back to that you know making sure that everything is within that same ecosystem net of azure or power platform to make things easier get your teams you know for your teams uh integration with sharepoint your uh, your Office 365 Active Directory management, that all of that, you know, having all of that exchange, that's another thing, exchange, having having your email management uh, or email servers hosted in the same platform, all of that is, all of that is extremely, extremely valuable. And, and we're seeing so much, so much growth in, in the sense of the need for, for, for supporting those migrations. Yeah, and it's and it seems that that's but at least in my experiences, my point of view into everything is from recruitment and what skills are in demand at what level. And it seems like when we're talking about seasoned, experienced technical architect, you know, yeah, it's just presumed that you understand everything at 
a modular level of how it all works and you're up to snuff with power automate and uh but the the biggest thing that separates out a very senior technical architect from maybe even just a senior developer or whatnot it seems to be that that enterprise uh integrations with with other business applications migrating massive amounts to da data from one place to the other um you know what what makes those data migrations particularly challenging and and why is there so much emphasis put on it why are these jobs that oversee these portions of projects what i mean for me why are they so well paid right what what makes them challenging yeah that's a great question eric uh the the number one culprit of why these are challenging generally is cost the second is uh, the second is the level of effort or time to be able to produce or develop uh, the the actual integration and make sure that it's functioning. And probably the third reason is is um, just a client's particular politics internally with IT as to what you know what IT feels comfortable supporting because at the end of the day, IT knows that they're going to have to keep an eye on that integration. And so there's this new responsibility that gets added to the, the IT team. And, and that definitely is a factor that I, that I run into quite a bit. So those are, those are the big ones. I think that cost can now be mitigated by educating our clients about what's available in the Azure cloud in terms of how, how, how minuscule the costs are for creating some really robust integrations. So that's what I try to explain to my clients who are a little confused about what to do. Uh, and also as far as, you know, training um, their IT people, forgive me, uh, training their IT people to make sure that they know how to support the integration, they understand creating good documentation really, you know, is important. Um, but those are the, those are the, the, the key challenges is, is, you know, how much is it going to cost me? Okay. And how, 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 how long are you going to take to build this? Because the more, as you know, we work in a billable hours world, the developer and the Microsoft architect or consultant, whatever you want to call me. And so in that billable world, the client is thinking to themselves, every single hour that is being spent on this data integration uh, is, 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 is expensive. It could be, we don't know, right? I'm not gonna throw any numbers out there, but we know that each hour can be very pricey. And you start getting into the hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on what kind of client you have and what kind of data you're moving and the volume there's so many factors. So one of the things that's incredibly important is for a company to really kind of evaluate internally and say, what am I really trying to accomplish here? And what is my real budget? Because at the end of the day, what you're going to get what you pay for. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's just understanding the limitations of, you know, if you go this direction versus this direction with, with Azure Data Factory, which I think, like I said, I, I really is a phenomenal solution right now. And I think a lot of companies are going to start considering that. I've seen it already myself uh, over the last year specifically. Yeah, you you touch on something really important uh, that is uh, when, I think if you talk to the the average person, about what they think a technology consultant does. Uh, they would probably think they're writing code all day, every day. Uh, but you touched on a point about educating the client. And it seems to me this conversation that it happens a lot, there's almost more time spent educating the client on what's possible and out there and options than actually all right, let's put it together. <laughs> let's let's make it happen. Um, you know, would you, would you agree with that? Would you would you say that the job entails far more education now than before, uh, rather than 
physically actually putting together solutions? Yes, uh, integration is a very sensitive point for the, for our clients. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's small, medium, large business. It always, always is something that requires a tremendous amount of hand holding and uh, uh, providing knowledge about you know how it's a lot of clients. I have a lot of clients who ask me, you know, can you give me some examples of other companies that you've done this with? That's a that's that's getting more and more common. And you know, we look at sales and we say, hey, do you have any? <laughs> Do you have any 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 examples? And and as you can imagine, you know, with NDAs and things like that, we can't really we can't really go out and and show work that we've done or or necessarily speak about a specific company unless they give us you know approval to. But yeah, the reality is that having that knowledge intrinsically about what in what the integration options are. And starting that process too by understanding what that business does, like what they're what 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 are they what industry are they in? What's the volume? This is where it starts to get more into the kind of narrowing down the scope of understanding what's the volume of data that you're going to flow across your ecosystem. How many how many integration points are you going to have? There's so much to talk about there, and clients get overwhelmed regardless of whether they're technical or not. They don't even have to be. Yeah. It could be a C-suite audience that gets it more than the IT people do. And so it just kind of depends. And so I think that it is absolutely true, Eric, that uh, right now providing knowledge about something so so common and integral to, to the, the space of data migration, integration, um, handling data flows, also, the, the 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 cleanliness of data, all of that is is driven by spending a lot of investment, making a lot of investment um, in in educating the client about what their what their possibilities are and their options. Sure, certainly. Yeah. Thank you. That's uh yeah. That's that's a lot to mull over as far as the the one of the biggest changes in the, the actual work. Um, to shift gears a little bit, what are, I mean, what are the most exciting changes that you're seeing now for the future of the technology in general and, and how, and, and this could be a more wider ranging topic too. It doesn't necessarily have to be dynamics, power platform, but um, I think the, the, Bigger question is, what's the most exciting and unique changes you see happening with how humans are interacting with computers for business needs? You know, what are, what are trends that you've seen where you're like, oh, this is interesting. I wonder where it's going. Yeah, so Eric, I think that right now, uh, the industry is shifting dramatically. I think this is the biggest thing I've noticed is AI. It's the concept of AI. That's all I see everywhere that I go, every email that I get, it's almost like overwhelmingly AI. And I think that, um, for example, uh, programs like Copilot, as they evolve, Microsoft Copilot, as they evolve more and more and collect more data, uh, which is how AI works in the first place anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. The more they collect data, the, the, the more successful they're going to be. And I think what's going to start happening is, and it's already happening, but it's going to transform businesses, that concept of AI. What, what, what people are trying to do is find a method because at the end of the day, we've historically hired people to research data and try to extrapolate information from reports and say okay this is gonna you know we project right we project in this report that that this is what the outcome is gonna be and uh or should be there's a 50 percent chance let's just say that but with ai what's happening is it's taking all of this massive big data and compiling it together and parsing through it in such a way in a way that i I couldn't possibly understand, but the reality is that there's an algorithm there, right? 
just like Google has an algorithm for SEO and so on and so forth, all of that. Uh, and, and it's and it's driving, it's gonna start driving more decisions than, than ever before. And so, I mean, I could, I could say AI, even from the recruitment process is gonna start driving more, more of the decisions. AI is helping, if you look at LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn has now built in a semi copilot um of you know where you can it, it helps you write your resume it helps you write your you know update your profile and it actually does a pretty good job of even though it doesn't know you it it, it parses through your emails and parses through copilot does a lot of uh, really really great things and so i think that ai like copilot is just the beginning like the fact that i can write an email now that and then just edit just a tiny little bit of it. Yet it's a nicely written email. It's direct. It's a message that is to my to my client that that is asking for something potentially, but at the same time it's exactly it's a sync, right? So yeah. AI, you know, capturing information about sales volumes across different products. If you're in the retail industry. Uh, then that's that information can be parsed through the algorithm and, and we can turn that into actionable data uh, that you can say, you know what, it does make sense to invest here more. We see that that there's a there's a there's a pattern here. And then from a service perspective, from a managed service company perspective, which is where I've worked, you know, for for pretty much more than a decade, that is going to be also trying to understand what trends i think it makes a lot of sense for ai to say what trends uh, in terms of products and services that we're offering make the most sense what are we seeing that 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 in the data in the raw data that tells us you know what maybe we should be expanding our horizons and offering you know the entire dynamic ce uh, model and even finance and operations as a company like there is an opportunity there and companies are going to start seeing that their 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 verticals are going to expand they might have two verticals now and then based on ai they may have eight verticals now because they realize that their data is flowing in a certain direction and it's it's telling them you know that they should be making or thinking bigger i think that that's really what it what it comes down to and it also helps mitigate damage too. It, you know, you can also see when bad things are coming, and I think, or potentially coming. And I think that helps companies also adapt to the change. Yeah. Yeah. the The biggest thing about AI that struck me, and, and you were talking about LinkedIn. So um, I have LinkedIn recruiter license, and I was doing some outreach. Uh, I forget what it was for. It doesn't matter too much, but what I do recruitment wise, very niche focus, very specific, right? Uh, it had started suggesting, all right, here's what the AI has for your outreach message that I was going to send to candidates and LinkedIn recruiter. And it was all over the place. It was so bad. Nothing that I would write. It was intelligible, you know, you, it, it made sense. And I could see where if I were uh, casting a wider net, for a more general type of labor than something as specific as a dynamics <laughs> consultant, um, it would make sense. But uh, it got me thinking, though, that right, the the artificial intelligence is really just an amalgamation and conglomerating all the human intelligence that we pumped into the machine already, right? Um, that it has to focus on the data and all those the inputs of the data are from us. So it got me thinking that if Microsoft on the business application side is training its AIs to help build things based on human activity, is there an ethical issue to that, right? Because when you hire someone to say, build some power apps for you for a solution, uh, you know, to take, this piece of data, whatever it is, maybe this PDF, grab it from this email, put it in this OneDrive, convert it to this, send a workflow to that, do it to that. And, and someone puts together such a beautifully simple power automate flow for that. Then Microsoft recognizes like, oh, wow, that was like, that is actually a really effective way to do it. And a lot of people are doing it. Then all of a sudden, when you type in that's what you want into copilot it shoots you out that same solution because it recognizes oh this is what other places are doing 
is that is that kind of violating like sort of like trade secrets or proprietary knowledge like if i were a company and i paid someone who i thought was really good at working with power platform and I, you know and that's giving me a competitive edge out there because they're i hired the smartest person ever to give us the best solutions they're the fastest most sustainable easiest but then all of a sudden an ai is learning that that other places have access to that's training itself on that you, you see any like ethical conum, conundrum there in the future where you know places like microsoft or any other tech firm are, is going to have to be very transparent like exactly what activities and what types of data they're using to build the ai on absolutely i mean if you think about just you know uh gdpr um when it comes to you know marketing to your clients there's a lot of uh red tape there and uh and so i think that uh, without a doubt, uh, there, there, there could be an ethical consideration here in the standpoint that the data that we're collecting uh, with these AI tools is a lot of the times, and I'm surprised if it wouldn't be, but it's customer data. And it's yeah, that, right. customer, that, that customer data is that, that it, these AI tools are parsing through. I don't think we explicitly have uh, I mean, if I'm if I'm not working at firm, whatever ABC company, we don't explicitly have rights to necessarily uh, leverage that data in such a way that that we can uh, use it to 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 take any extra actions or perform decisions or. Or oh, let's put it this way: we can't take advantage of that data. We don't have an explicit contract and i think this is right my as if it was on your server only you have it only you can access it and yeah. like that's going to give you a competitive advantage to the type of data and how you treat it and interact with it versus if it's on a server that microsoft owns somewhere and they're training ais on it that they want to deliver to all of their customers and you're right. kind of the sucker for inputting it in there in the first place you know what i mean like I do, I do, and I think that that it, you know, it's interesting. I haven't thought of it that way, but the reality is that it is very possible, very possible that uh, that that's something that uh, AI, regardless of the firm that's 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 providing the service, it, it's or is the, yeah. Or is the larger ethical question is that is it because is this like a utilitarian type of approach is it the greatest good for the greatest number and therefore everybody's like you know what that's fine yeah they, they I can train itself because i'm going to benefit from what everybody else is doing too and so therefore if the the playing field is kind of equal for everyone i mean where you know it's like where do you line up the trade-offs there i don't think that conversation is happening enough about where everything's going and trending. It was something that I tried to start a LinkedIn uh, conversation about uh, a little while ago. It, it, you know, uh, didn't take off as <laughs> I thought it. I thought it would, but uh, it's an important one to be having nonetheless. You know. I think if a client hasn't given you, I mean, and, and I don't want to say this being the norm, but it, it's very possible that in the future this will be the case because AI is so new right now in the sense that people are just now understanding. It's like when the smart home concept came out, remember? Like people, there was there were the, the people who were the original buyers of the equipment. And then later on, you had um or like the adoptionists i guess you could say the adopters early adopters yeah, right? first early adopters yeah right, right now from an ai perspective we also have like early adopter managed service provider firms that are going to say okay well we this is what the value that we see in ai let's go ahead and set up a contract with company a to be able to provide them with you know new analytics on their marketing campaigns or other analytics around their customer service operations but at the end of the day if the data that's being parsed through is the, is another customer's data you 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 would you would probably run into a situation where you're going to have to explicitly have something in place that that allows that type of uh that type of activity 
if the if the data is all of the customers' data and it's just running on their own network, I think that's okay. And I think maybe that's what people should do. I think that's the way to get around it. Is I think that if you're using AI, um, for, uh, you know, robust AI services, that the the data remain on the on the customers' actual network and all of the services are tied to that so that there are no implications of uh, you know things that you know confidential data or anything like that we don't run into that i think that would be the best way to mitigate that possibility that ethical problem is just doing that okay nice the and now i keep going, i'm going back this i'm, I'm going to sh sh shift it into something fun because you mentioned and I wrote a LinkedIn article about this a while ago, and it was comparing songwriting and musical notation, not so much musical notation, but more like modes, uh, and a little bit of music theory with uh, software development. You know, it was actually really just like, I, I went side by side analysis of putting together a 12 bar blues and developing the software development life cycle you know um and it was uh it was pretty interesting all the way to like the code being the notes that are good and it's like well you say it's an e you use the e major scale sure it'll, it'll work but it's not gonna sound bluesy so it's like we know the rules we know the code in that scale but but then we know about the blues scale what really makes it blues is is when you break the rules in the code that's the real code of the blues right and then you're talking about like minor thirds and flat sevenths and and then you know i compare that to the difference between good software engineers and great software engineers they're like well yeah i'm sure we could do it this way it work but look look here's what we can you know here's a different way to crack the egg they'll be more effective and you know so i i had a whole 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 bit on that i mean how often do you find yourself comparing you know music and how it works with software <laughs> so that's interesting um and i had a, i remember i had a chance to read that article and i thought it was fantastic one of your best eric uh i think you know as a musician um you know as an amateur musician i i am always always driven by music and uh and that's just part of my daily life uh, as a developer i'll be listening to music to to focus i actually can't focus without music in some cases you know so i gotta have some sort of of noise in this case it's a it's a beautiful noise and music and the way that notes resonate with me uh, you know is is something that's important to 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 the way i the way i operate in a business setting uh, with that being said, I I haven't you know I've thought about I've thought about music more so as uh, an avenue uh, that you can use to I, I think the way that the comparison that you made to you know how you have you know minor sevenths or um, major major scales or things like that I think the best way I could see it is metaphorically. Uh, I haven't really personally made that connection, but it makes sense is that, you know, when you're working a great project, let's just say you have an enterprise project, well then shoot, you're going to have to, you're going to have to play a, uh, like a, a, a massive solo. Um, you know what I mean? Uh, to, to, uh, to just, and to perfection. Right. And it could be, you know, that, you know, stairway to heaven solo. But the, the point is, you know, arguably just, one the most perfect ever. Uh, yeah, so it's okay, one yeah one. music is is uh, integral to uh, so many people's lives. It's really hard, to, honestly, to find people who don't absolutely have some relationship with music. I think it's just it, it is part of our lives in in the business context. Um, I, I couldn't agree with you more that there is, you know, like a there's like a parallel there in that when you write music or when you make music it's it's similar that you need to go outside of the box let's put it that way in in the programming or in the professional uh, microsoft consulting industry you can't 
you can either play it exactly as it is in the books and and that's fine no feeling right yeah. you, or you could actually take this project and say you know what i'm going to bring in the best that i got and i am going to go outside of the box i'm going to think in ways yeah. that are going to most benefit you and i think in music you can look at that benefit in the sense that it just sounds better when you take the roads that have not been traveled as much so right uh, sometimes yeah. sometimes the jazz is is more fitting than marching band yeah there you go so if you're playing music like i know you're you're a great musician eric and i think that if you're playing uh <laughs> if you're playing music and and you deviate from the norm but it's still the same song it's it's there's something beautiful about that and there's something beautiful about that ability to do that too and i think that 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 does translate into the the modern workplace as the as the microsoft or d365 developer or consultant it is it is something we don't think about but mathematics and music are at the back end of everything that we do even business conversations it's all at the end of the day it all comes down to math and music is math and mathematics are beautiful and perfect and so music is inherently perfect so yeah i think that for sure great yeah that was a good one so last last topic you know i like ending things on a on a positive note you know part of it of uh, the reason why I, you know, do these episodes is for folks that might be considering a career uh, working with Microsoft Dynamics and perhaps maybe not Dynamics, just tech consulting in general. And so for anyone just embarking on that journey, you know, of uh, a career in the Microsoft Dynamics space or just tech consulting in general, what, uh, what words of advice would you have for them? Yeah, thank you, Eric. So I think honestly, anybody right now that is on the pathway, uh, whether you're just getting started or you are a seasoned uh, professional, uh, I think the reality is you need to, um, number one, spend time learning about the latest technologies and what's really popular right now and getting familiar with those technologies Number two, make sure that uh, you believe in yourself, that you believe in your capabilities. Uh, it, it doesn't matter what stage you are in your career, but coming into this, uh, you know, like I said, for me, it was an accident getting into this industry. Uh, and I've been very blessed to continue working in it. And I, you know, very passionate about it. And I think you'll you will also have that success and you just have to believe in yourself and you have to look at companies that that your you know your heart resonates with and you have a passion for what they do i think that's the third thing is look into look into the firms that that uh, are are hiring that are actually doing something for the community that you're very you're very close to or you feel a a, a strong pull towards um, that will help you as well in your career. So with that, I, I would, I'll leave you and, uh, you know, with best wishes in your, in your journey, uh, you know, on the dynamics door and finding yeah. that, group, right? So. Yep, absolutely. And as Bob Ross would say, I want to point out, happy little accidents, right? And that's, that's why the two of us are right here right now. <laughs> it's just uh, some happy accidents along the journey of life that, that pulled us together. Alex, uh, I want to thank you for carving out some time to be on the show. You're an excellent guest. We hit so many great topics. Uh, for anybody out there that wants to get a hold of Alex or myself, you know where to find us on LinkedIn. Again, my name is Eric Legear, your host for Dynamic Store. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day or night wherever you are. Duh.